Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. I've always been an adventurer at heart. The thrill of discovering new places, especially those untouched by the modern world, has always been irresistible to me. This passion led me to explore many off the beaten path locations, but none was as haunting as the old road in the outskirts of my hometown. It was a road that everyone seemed to have forgotten about. Overgrown with weeds and barely visible, it was said to lead to an abandoned village that had been deserted for reasons no one could remember. Local legends spoke of strange occurrences, of people who ventured there and were never the same again, but I dismissed these as mere tales to keep curious kids away. One summer evening, armed with a backpack, a flashlight, and my camera, I decided to explore this forgotten road. The sun was setting, casting long shadows that danced with the gentle breeze. The chirping of crickets and the distant hoot of an owl were the only sounds accompanying me. As I walked further, the surroundings became eerier. The trees seemed denser, and a thick fog began to roll in, reducing visibility. But I pressed on, driven by curiosity. After what felt like hours, I stumbled upon the remnants of the abandoned village. Dilapidated house houses, overgrown with ivy, stood as silent witnesses to a time long gone. I began to explore the houses, each telling its own story. Old photographs, children's toys, and other personal belongings were scattered around, as if the inhabitants had left in a hurry. But as I delved deeper, an unsettling feeling grew within me. It felt as if I was being watched. Shaking off the feeling, I continued my exploration. But as I entered one particular house, the atmosphere changed drastically. It was colder, and a pungent smell filled the air. In the living room, I found a journal, its page yellow with age. The entries spoke of a happy family of daily life in the village, but as I flipped through, the tone became darker. The writer spoke of strange figures seen at night, of whispers in the wind, and of villagers disappearing without a trace. Suddenly, a loud bang echoed through the house. I jumped, my heart racing. I strained my ears, trying to identify the source. It sounded like footsteps, but not of a human. They were uneven, heavy, and seemed to come from all directions. Panicking, I grabbed my belongings and rushed out of the house. The fog was now so thick that I could barely see a few feet ahead. The footsteps grew louder and closer. I ran, my breath ragged, my mind racing. Every shadow, every rustle of the leaves made me jump. After what felt like an eternity, I saw the familiar outline at the main road. Relief washed over me as I sprinted towards it. But just as I was about to reach safety, a figure emerged from the fog. It was tall, with long, spindly limbs and glowing eyes. It stood there, watching me, its presence paralyzing me with fear. Lustering all my strength, I screamed and threw my flashlight at it. The figure recoiled, and I seized the opportunity to run. I didn't stop until I reached my car, parked at the beginning of the forgotten road. The weeks following my encounter were filled with paranoia. Every creak in my house, every unexpected knock on the door sent my heart racing. I became a recluse, avoiding social gatherings and staying indoors as much as possible. My friends and family grew concerned, but how could I explain the unexplainable? One evening, as I was trying to distract myself with a movie, there was a knock on my door. I froze, every fiber of my being screaming at me not to answer. But then I heard a familiar voice. It was Jake, my childhood friend. Relieved, I opened the door. Jake looked worried. Hey, I've been trying to call you. Everyone's been talking about how you've changed since that trip to the old road. What happened? I hesitated, then decided to tell him everything. As I recounted my experience, Jake's face grew pale. When I finished, he took a deep breath and said, I've heard stories about that place, but I never believed them until now. He then shared a tale his grandmother had told him. The village, she said, was once a thriving community, but one day, a strange arrived. No one knew where he came from or what he wanted. He kept to himself, living on the outskirts of the village. But soon after his arrival, villagers began to disappear. Panic spread, and one by one, families left, leaving behind their belongings and memories. The stranger was rumored to be a practitioner of dark arts, seeking eternal life. He was said to have made a pact with malevolent forces, sacrificing the villagers in exchange for immortality. Over time, the village was forgotten, but the stranger, now a cursed entity, remained bound to the land. Jake's story said shivers down my spine. It all made sense now. The journal, the footsteps, the figure with the glowing eyes, they were all pieces of a dark puzzle. Determined to find answers, Jake and I decided to visit his grandmother. She was a wise old woman, known for her knowledge of local legends. As we narrated my encounter, she listened intently, her face grave. 
When we finished, she spoke in a hushed tone. The entity you encountered is bound to the village, but it can latch onto anyone who ventures there, following them, feeding off their fear. She then gave us a small amulet, claiming it had protective properties. This might keep him at bay, but remember, such entities are cunning. Always be on your guard. Grateful, we left, the weight of the revelation heavy on our shoulders. I wore the amulet everywhere, and over time, the disturbances reduced. The footsteps grew fainter, and the overwhelming sense of dread began to wane. Buds turned into years, and life returned turned to normal, but I never forgot that fateful night. The amulet became a constant companion, a silent guardian against the darkness. The old road and its sinister secrets remain, a chilling testament to the past, but one thing's for sure, some places, no matter how intriguing, are best left unexplored. I've always been fascinated by urban exploration. The thrill of discovering forgotten places, of uncovering stories lost to time, was an addiction. My city, with its rich history, provided ample opportunities for such adventures. But one place, in particular, had always eluded me, the old subway station beneath 5th Avenue. Decommissioned in the 1960s due to structural concerns, the station had become the stuff of legends. Rumors spoke of it being haunted, of homeless people disappearing there, never to be seen again. Naturally, such tales only fueled my curiosity. One evening, armed with a flashlight, a camera, and a map of the old subway system, I decided to venture into the station. Accessing it was tricky. The main entrances had been sealed off, but after some research, I found a maintenance tunnel that would lead me there. The descent into the station was eerie. The air grew colder, and the only sound was the distant drip of water. As I stepped onto the platform, I was taken aback by how well preserved it was. The tiles, though grimy, still bore the intricate patterns of yesteryears. Old advertisements, faded with time, adorned the walls. I began to explore, snappy pictures, and taking in the atmosphere. But as I ventured deeper, an unsettling feeling grew within me. I felt watched. Every so often, I'd hear faint whispers or see shadows darting just out of my line of sight. Trying to shake off the unease, I continued my exploration. That's when I stumbled upon an old train car. It was in surprisingly good condition, given the years of neglect. Curiosity peaked. I decided to take a look inside. The interior was pristine, as if the train had been in use just yesterday. The seats were intact, and the overhead lights, though dim still worked, but what caught my attention was a newspaper on one of the seats. The date was from over 50 years ago, and the headline spoke of a train that had mysteriously disappeared in this very station. As I read, the temperature in the car dropped drastically, the lights began to flicker, and the whispers grew louder, more insistent. Panic set in. I rushed out of the train, my flashlights beamed dancing wildly as I tried to find my way back to the platform. But the station I changed, the once pristine tiles were now cracked and broken. The advertisements were gone, replaced by graffiti that read, leave while you still can. I ran, my breath ragged, the whispers now deafening screams in my ears. Just as I thought I was lost, I saw the maintenance tunnel up ahead. I sprinted towards it, not daring to look back. Emerging into the night, the cold air never felt so good. I made my way back to the surface, the events of the night replaying in my mind. Had I imagined it all, or had I truly stumbled upon the resting place of the lost train and its passengers? I decided to research the missing train further. The record spoke of a train that had vanished without a trace, along with all its passengers. Despite extensive searches, no trace of it was ever found. The incident was one of the reasons the station was decommissioned. The days following my harrowing experience were filled with unease. Every creak in my apartment, every unexpected shadow made me jump. Sleep was elusive, with nightmares of the station and its ghostly inhabitants plaguing my nights. One evening, as I was trying to distract myself with some TV, there was a knock on my door. I approached cautiously, peering through the peephole. To my surprise, it was an elderly woman, her face lined with age but her eyes sharp and alert. I opened the door, and she introduced herself as Mrs. Alina Gray. She claimed to be a historian, specializing in the city's subway system. Word had gotten around about my exploration, and she wanted to hear my account firsthand. Reluctantly, I invited her in and recounted my experience. As I spoke, her face grew pale, and she seemed lost in thought. When I finished, she took a deep breath and said, I believe you, because you see, my grandfather was on that train. She went on to explain that her grandfather had been a businessman, returning home after a late meeting. He had boarded the train at the 5th Avenue station, and that was the last anyone ever saw of him. His disappearance had devastated the family, and the mystery had haunted them for generations. Alina had dedicated her life to uncovering the truth. She had heard the legends, of course, but had always dismissed them as mere urban myths. But my account had changed everything. Together, we decided to delve deeper into the mystery. Alina's research led us to old city records, which hinted at a cover-up. The station's closure, it seemed, was not just due to structural concerns. There were reports 
reports of other strange occurrences of maintenance workers hearing voices and seeing apparitions. Our investigation caught the attention of local media and soon, others came forward with their stories. It became clear that the station was a hotspot for paranormal activity. Determined to find answers, Alina and I, along with a team of paranormal investigators, decided to venture into the station once more. Armed with state-of-the-art equipment, we set out one fateful night. The station was just as I remembered, its eerie silence amplifying every sound. As we explored, our equipment picked up on various anomalies. Cold spots, electromagnetic fluctuations, and even faint EVPs that sounded like distant conversations. But the most chilling discovery was in the train car. Our thermal camera picked up on multiple figures, seated as if on a journey. Eleanor, tears in her eyes, whispered that one of the figures resembled old photographs of her grandfather. We left the station with more questions than answers, but our findings reignited interest in the old subway system, leading to calls for its preservation as a historical site. Eleanor and I remained close, bound by our shared experience. We all often spoke of that night, of the souls trapped in an endless journey. And while we never found definitive answers, we took solace in the fact that we had shed light on a forgotten chapter of the city's history. The 5th Avenue station remained sealed, a silent testament to the mysteries of the past. Let those who know its story speak of it with reverence, a reminder that some things are beyond our understanding. The first time I noticed him was on a crisp autumn morning. I was on my usual joggy route through the park, lost in thought, when a sudden movement caught my eye. A man, standing a little distance away, was watching me intently. His gaze was unwavering, and even from that distance, I could feel its intensity. Brushing it off as a random occurrence, I continued on my way. Over the next few weeks, I began to see him more frequently. At the coffee shop, the library, even outside my workplace. He was always at a distance, never approaching, just watching. His appearance was nondescript average height, brown hair, always dressed in a plain gray hoodie and jeans. But his eyes, those piercing blue eyes, were unforgettable. Concerned, I mentioned it to my friends. They suggested it might be a coincidence or perhaps he had a crush on me. But something deep down told me this was different. This wasn't admiration, it was an obsession. One evening, as I was leaving work, I felt an eerie sensation, like I was being followed. Quickening my pace, I darted into a nearby store and watched discreetly from the window. Sure enough, he was there, standing across the street, his gaze fixed on the store's entrance. Panicking, I called the police. They arrived promptly, but by then, he had disappeared. They took my statement and assured me they'd keep an eye out, but without any overt threats or actions, there was little they could do. Determined to take matters into my own hands, I decided to confront him. The next time I spotted him, outside my gym, I walked straight up to him, my heart pounding. Why are you following me? I demanded. He looked taken aback, his cold demeanor faltering for a moment. I just, I just wanted to be close to you. He stammered. His response said, and chills down my spine. I warned him to stay away and informed the gym's security about him. They assured me they'd be on the lookout, but things escalated from there. I began receiving anonymous letters at my home, filled with ramblings about our connection and how we were meant to be together. Disturbingly, they contained details about my daily life, things only someone who had been watching closely would know. One evening, as I was getting ready for bed, I heard a noise coming from my living room. Cautiously, I peeked out and was horrified to see him standing there, going through my personal belongings. I locked myself in my bedroom and dialed 911. The police arrived within minutes, arresting him on the spot. It turned out he had been stalking me for months, documenting my every move. He had a history of similar behavior with multiple restraining orders against him. In the aftermath of the ordeal, my trust in people was deeply shaken. Every stranger became a potential threat, every unexpected glance a cause for alarm. My once vibrant social life dwindled as I withdrew from friends and activities, seeking solace in the safety of my new apartment. But as the weeks turned into months, a realization dawned on me I couldn't let one person's twisted obsession dictate the course of my life. I began attending therapy where I met others who had faced similar traumas. Their stories while unique in detail, echoed the same themes of violation, fear, and resilience. One woman, Lisa, had been stalked by an ex-boyfriend for years. He had used technology to track her every move, even hacking into her personal accounts. Another, Raj, had been harassed by a former colleague who believed they were destined to be together. Their stories were harrowing, but they also spoke of hope, of reclaiming their lives from the shadows of their stalkers. Inspired by their strength, I decided to start a support group. We met weekly, sharing our experiences, coping strategies, 
and resources. The group became a lifeline for many, a safe space to heal and empower one another. Word spread, and soon we had members from all walks of life joining us. We organized workshops on personal safety, digital security, and legal rights. We collaborated with law enforcement, ensuring that stalking cases were taken seriously and that victims had the resources they needed. One day, during a group session, a young man named Alex shared his story. He had been stalked by a woman he had met online. She had become obsessed with him, sending him hundreds of messages daily and showing up at his workplace. This story highlighted the fact that anyone, regardless of gender, could be a victim of stalking. Together, we launched a public awareness campaign, debunking myths about stalking and highlighting the importance of early intervention. Our efforts were recognized by local media, and soon we were invited to schools, colleges, and community centers to share our stories and educate others. The support group evolved into a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping victims of stalking and raising awareness about the issue. We advocated for stricter laws and worked with tech companies to develop tools to protect users' privacy. As for me, the trauma of being stalked will always be a part of my story, but it's no longer the defining chapter. Today, I stand as an advocate, a beacon of hope for others facing similar nightmares. I've learned that while we can't control the actions of others, we can choose how we respond, and in that choice lies our power. I had always been drawn to older buildings. There was something about their history, the stories they held within their walls, that fascinated me. So, when I found an affordable apartment in a century-old building in the heart of the city, I was ecstatic. The building had its quirks, creaky floorboards, drafty windows, and an old-fashioned elevator that groaned with every ascent. But it was filled with character, from the ornate moldings to the vintage tiles in the hallway. My neighbors seemed friendly enough. There was Mrs. Patterson, an elderly woman who had lived in the building for decades, and a young couple, Mark and Lisa, who were always up for a chat in the hallway. But it was the man in the apartment next to mine, apartment 3B, that piqued my curiosity. I rarely saw him, but I often heard him. And late at night, I'd hear soft whispers coming from his apartment as if he was talking to someone, but whenever I passed by his door, I never heard any other voices. It was always just him, whispering softly, his words indecipherable. One evening, as I was returning home from work, I bumped into Mrs. Patterson in the hallway. We exchanged pleasantries, and I casually mentioned the whispering neighbor. Her face turned pale, and she glanced nervously at apartment 3B's door. That apartment has a history, she said in a hushed tone. Many years ago, a young woman lived there. She disappeared under mysterious circumstances, and no one knows what happened to her. Some say the apartment is cursed. I chuckled, dismissing it as an urban legend. But Mrs. Patterson's words stayed with me, and that night, as I lay in bed, the whispers seemed louder, more insistent. Curiosity getting the better of me, I decided to introduce myself to the mysterious neighbor. I baked some cookies and knocked on his door. After a few moments, the door creaked open, revealing a man in his late 40 seconds with disheveled hair and a gaunt face. His eyes, however, were the most striking, deep blue and filled with sadness. I introduced myself and handed him the cookies. He thanked me, his voice soft and melodic. We chatted briefly, and I learned that his name was Robert. He had lived in the apartment for a few years and kept to himself due to personal reasons. Feeling a bit more at ease, I returned to my apartment, but that night, the whispers grew louder. I could hear Robert's voice clearly, but there was another voice, a woman's voice, voice, responding to him. The conversation was heated, filled with anger and sadness. Concerned, I approached Mark and Lisa the next day. They too had heard the whispers but had dismissed them as the ramblings of a lonely man. But the mention of the woman's voice unsettled the man. Determined to get to the bottom of this, we decided to approach Robert together. We knocked on his door, and after a few moments, he opened it, his face pale and eyes red, as if he had been crying. We expressed our concerns, and after a moment of hesitation, Robert invited us in. His apartment was filled with old photographs, all of a beautiful young woman with raven black hair and a radiant smile. That's Emily, Robert said, his voice breaking. She was my fiance. We lived in this apartment together. One day, she went out and never returned. No one knows what happened to her. Tears streamed down his face as he recounted the days of searching, the sleepless nights, and the overwhelming grief. I hear her voice. He whispered, every night, she speaks to me, telling me she is still here, waiting for me. We left Robert's apartment, our hearts heavy with sympathy. The whispers, it seemed, were a manifestation of his grief, a way for him to cope with the loss of his beloved Emily. But that night, as I lay in bed, I heard the whispers again. Only this time, they were coming from inside my apartment. I froze, my heart racing, as the soft voice of a woman whispered, help me. Terrified, I turned on the lights and searched my apartment, but there was no one there. The whispers, however, continued, growing louder and more desperate. The next morning, I approached Mrs. Patterson, seeking answers. She listened intently, her face grave. The spirit of Emily is restless, she said. She is trying 
trying to communicate to tell her story with her guidance, we held a seance in Robert's apartment. As we sat in a circle, candles flickering, the room grew cold. A soft voice, unmistakably Emily's, filled the room. I never left, she whispered. I'm still here, trapped, waiting to be set free. Fear streamed down Robert's face as he reached out, trying to touch the spirit of his lost love. I'm so sorry, he whispered. I never stopped looking for you. The room grew warm again, and the presence of Emily faded. But the atmosphere was filled with a sense of peace and closure. Life in the city continued its usual hustle and bustle, but for the residents of the old building, things had changed. The whispers of Emily's story spread, and soon, our building became a point of interest for many. Paranormal enthusiasts, journalists, and the simply curious would often stop by, hoping to catch a glimpse or sound of the mysterious Emily. Robert, however, found it hard to move on. The seance had provided some closure, but the weight of his grief was still palpable. He would often be seen sitting by the window of his apartment, lost in thought, gazing at the old photographs of Emily. One day, as I was returning from work, I found a small crowd gathered outside the building. Whispered conversations and hushed tones filled the air. Pushing through, I discovered the reason for the commotion. Robert's apartment door was ajar, and inside, the room was filled with lit candles, casting flickery shadows on the walls. At the center, surrounded by old photographs of Emily, was Robert, lifeless. The shock and grief were overwhelming. The building, which had already seen its share of tragedies, was once again plunged into mourning. The police ruled it as a suicide, a final act of a man overwhelmed by his grief. In the days that followed, the residents came together, supporting each other in their shared grief. Mrs. Patterson, ever the pillar of strength, organized a memorial for Robert. People from all walks of life attended, sharing their memories and stories of the kind, gentle man who had loved so deeply. The building, with its rich history and tales of love and loss, became a symbol of the city's past. Efforts were made to preserve it, and soon, it was declared a heritage site. Tours were organized, with the proceeds going to mental health charities, ensuring that Robert's story would serve as a reminder of the importance of mental well-being. As for me, the events of the past few months had taken their toll. I decided to move to a quieter town, seeking peace and a fresh start. But the memories of the old building, of Robert and Emily, and the lessons they taught me about love, loss, and resilience stayed with me. Years later, I returned to the city for a visit. The old building stood tall, a testament to the passage of time. As I walked its hallways, memories flooded back. But amidst the nostalgia, there was a sense of peace, a feeling that the souls who had once inhabited these walls had finally found their rest. And as I stood by the window of apartment 3B, I could almost hear the soft whispers of Emily, a gentle reminder of the love that once was in the legacy it left behind. Every morning, I'd take the same route to work, order the same coffee from the same cafe, and sit at the same park bench during my lunch break. This routine brought me comfort, a sense of stability in the chaotic world of city life. But it was this very routine that led me into the undervy path of someone I wish I'd never met. It began subtly. I started noticing a silver sedan parked near my office building. At first, I thought nothing of it. The city was sprawling, and cars came and went. But then I began seeing it near my apartment, at the grocery store, and even by the cafe I frequented. The same car, always parked at a distance, never too close to arouse suspicion, but close enough for me to notice. One evening, as I was leaving work, I decided to approach the car. As I neared, the engine revved, and it sped away, leaving me standing on the sidewalk, my heart pounding. The next day, I reported it to the police. They took note, but mentioned that without a license plate or a clear description of the driver, there wasn't much they could do. Days turned into weeks, and the presence of the silver sedan became a constant in my life. I tried changing my routine, taking different routes, and even staying over at a friend's place. But like a shadow, it always found me. One day, as I was sipping my coffee at the cafe, an unfamiliar face approached me. A woman, probably in her early 30 seconds, with jet black hair and piercing green eyes. Is this seat taken? She asked, pointing to the chair opposite me. I shook my head, and she sat down, introducing herself as Elise. We struck up a conversation, and I found myself drawn to her. She was articulate, witty, and seemed genuinely interested in getting to know me. Over the next few weeks, our casual cafe chats turned into dinner dates, and soon, we were spending a lot of time together. But as our relationship deepened, so did my sense of unease. Elise seemed to know a lot about me, details I had never shared. She'd casually mention a childhood memory or bring up a favorite book of mine, always brushing it off as a lucky guess or a shared interest. One evening, as we were watching a movie at her place, I excused myself to use the restroom. On my way, I stumbled upon a room with the door slightly ajar. Curiosity getting the better of me, I peeked inside. The room was filled with pictures. 
pictures of me from my childhood, my college days, and even recent ones from our dates. There were notes detailing my daily routines, my likes and dislikes, and even transcripts of our conversations. But the most chilling discovery was a set of car keys on the table. Car keys to a silver sedan. I felt a cold hand on my shoulder and turned to find Elise, her green eyes no longer warm but cold and calculating. I knew you'd find out eventually, she whispered. Panicking, I pushed past her and ran out of the apartment, not stopping until I reached the safety of my own home. I immediately called the police, who arrested Elise on charges of stalking and harassment. The subsequent investigation revealed a chilling backstory. Elise had been obsessed with me for years, ever since we had briefly met at a college seminar. She had followed me, documenting my life, and had even moved to the city to be closer to me. The silver sedan, it turned out, was just one of the many ways she kept tabs on me. The weeks following Elise's arrest were a blur of police interviews, court hearings, and sleepless nights. The media caught wind of the story, dubbing it the obsession of the silver sedan. My once private life was now a topic of public discussion, with reporters constantly trying to get an exclusive. My friends and family rallied around me, offering support and a listening ear, but the weight of the ordeal made it difficult to connect with them. I felt isolated, trapped in a bubble of paranoia and fear. One evening, as I was aimlessly channel surfing, I stumbled upon a support group for stalking victims. The group, Safe Haven, offered counseling, legal advice, and a platform for victims to share their stories. Desperate for a sense of understanding, I decided to attend their next meeting. Walking into the community center, I was greeted by a diverse group of individuals, each with their own harrowing tale of obsession and violation. As I listened to their stories, I realized I wasn't alone in my trauma. The group became a lifeline, a place where I could be vulnerable without judgment. Through Safe Haven, I met Maya, a vibrant woman in her late 20s. She had been stalked by an ex-boyfriend who couldn't accept their breakup. We bonded over our shared experiences and soon became close friends. Together, we navigated the complexities of healing, often leaning on each other during our lowest moments. As the months went by, Maya and I decided to turn our pain into purpose. We started a podcast, Whispers in the Dark, where we shared our stories and interviewed other victims, experts, and law enforcement officials. The podcast quickly gained traction, shedding light on the often overlooked issue of stalking and providing resources for those in need. Our efforts caught the attention of local authorities, who collaborated with us to organize workshops on personal safety and the importance of recognizing the signs of stalking. Schools, colleges, and workplaces began implementing our guidelines, ensuring that individuals had the tools to protect themselves. Elise's trial was a grueling process. The defense tried to paint her as a misunderstood lover, but the evidence was overwhelming. She was sentenced to several years in prison and mandated to undergo psychiatric evaluation and treatment. As for me, the experience with Elise forever changed the trajectory of my life. From a victim, I had become an advocate, using my voice to raise awareness and support others. The silver sedan, once a symbol of my trauma, was now a reminder of my resilience and strength. Today, as I walk the streets of the city, I do so with a renewed sense of purpose. The shadows of the past still linger, but they are overshadowed by the hope of a brighter future. A future where no one has to live in fear of the unfamiliar familiar. I had just moved to a small town in Oregon for a fresh start. The town, nestled between dense forests and rolling hills, was picturesque, with a tight-knit community that welcomed newcomers with open arms. I rented a quaint little house on the outskirts, surrounded by towering pine trees and the soothing sounds of nature. The first few weeks were uneventful. I settled into my new job at the local library, made a few friends, and enjoyed the peace and tranquility the town offered. But things took a strange turn one chilly autumn night. I was jolted awake by the shrill ring of my landline. Rogal I glanced at the clock. It was exactly midnight. Confused and slightly irritated, I picked up the receiver. Hello. I mumbled silence. Then a soft, raspy voice whispered, you shouldn't have come here. Before I could respond, the line went dead. I sat there, the weight of the call sinking in. It was probably a prank, I reasoned, trying to shake off the unease. But the next night, at precisely midnight, the phone rang again. The same voice, the same chilly message. This became a nightly ritual. Every night, at the stroke of midnight, the mysterious caller would deliver the same warning. I unplugged the phone, but the calls continued, now coming through my cell. I changed my number, but it made no difference. Desperate for answers, I approached the local police. They were sympathetic, but mentioned that without more concrete evidence, there wasn't much they could do. They suggested I keep a log of the calls and try to trace the number. One evening, after another unsettling call, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I drove to the town's only phone booth, located near the old gas station. To my horror, I found it off the hook, the receiver swinging 
swaying gently in the breeze. I approached the town's historian, Mr. Jenkins, hoping he might shed some light on the situation. Over a cup of tea, he recounted a tragic tale. Many years ago, a young woman had moved to the town, much like myself. She lived in the same house I had rented and worked at the library. But one fateful night, she disappeared, never to be seen again. The only clue was a series of mysterious phone calls she had received, always at midnight. The story sent chills down my spine. The parallels were uncanny. I decided to delve deeper, visiting the town's archives and speaking to its oldest residents. The pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. The young woman, Clara, had been in a relationship with a local man, Tom. But when she tried to end it, he became obsessed, stalking her every move. The midnight calls were his way of tormenting her, a game of cat and mouse. One night, in a fit of rage, he confronted her at her home, and she was never seen again. Tom was the prime suspect, but with no evidence and no body, he was never charged. Armed with this knowledge, I approached Tom, now an old man living on the fringes of the town. Our confrontation was intense. He initially denied everything, but as I pressed on, he broke down, confessing to the crime. Clara's body, he revealed, was buried in the woods behind my house. The police were notified, and Tom was arrested. Clara's remains were found, finally bringing closure to a mystery that had haunted the town for decades. The aftermath of Tom's confession sent ripples throughout the town. The community, which had for so long prided itself on its close-knit bonds and safety, was forced to confront the dark secret it had unknowingly harbored for decades. Many older residents remembered Clara, and the revelation brought a mix of relief and profound sadness. The local newspaper ran a series of articles on Clara, piecing together her life and the events leading up to her tragic end. I was approached for interviews multiple times, but I declined, wanting to maintain my privacy and process everything in my own time. However, the events had ignited a spark within me. The experience, as harrowing as it was, made me realize the importance of giving a voice to the voiceless. I decided to start a community group dedicated to revisiting cold cases and unresolved mysteries in the region. With the help of some friends and local enthusiasts, Echoes of the Past was born. Our group met weekly, poring over old newspaper clippings, police reports, and conducting interviews. They collaborated with law enforcement, providing fresh perspectives and resources to help solve long-forgotten cases. One case, in particular, stood out. A young boy, Jamie, had gone missing in the late 70 seconds after a day out fishing. His disappearance had always been attributed to a tragic accident. Perhaps he had fallen into the river and been swept away. But as we dug deeper, inconsistencies began to emerge. Witnesses were called seeing a strange car in the area that day, and there were reports of a man acting suspiciously near the riverbank. With renewed interest in the case, the police reopened their investigation. Using modern technology, they were able to identify and locate the car, leading them to a man now in his 60 seconds. Under questioning, he confessed to abducting Jamie all those years ago, a crime of opportunity that had haunted him ever since. The town hailed our group as heroes, but for us, it was never about the accolades. It was about justice, about ensuring that stories like Clara's and Jamie's were never forgotten. Years passed, and echoes of the past grew in size and scope. They collaborated with similar groups across the country, sharing resources and information. Our efforts led to the resolution of several cold cases, bringing closure to families who had waited decades for answers. As for me, the town of Oregon became my permanent home. The memories of the midnight caller and the discovery of Clara's fate would always be a part of me, but they no longer defined me. Instead, they served as a reminder of the resilience of the human spirit and the power of community. Today, as I sit on the porch of my new home, overlooking the serene landscape, I'm filled with a sense of gratitude. Gratitude for the second chance at life, for the friendships forged in adversity, and for the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of others. I've always been a city girl. The hustle and bustle, the never-ending energy, the myriad of cultures and experiences, it was home. So, when my job required me to relocate to a remote town in Montana for a six-month project, I was apprehensive. The town, named Hollow Creek, had a population of just under a thousand and was surrounded by vast stretches of forests and mountains. My new home was a cabin provided by the company located on the outskirts of Hollow Creek. It was rustic and charming, with a beautiful view of the dense woods. The first few days were an adjustment. The the silence of the night, the lack of city lights, and the sheer isolation were both eerie and fascinating. One evening, as I was settling down with a book by the fireplace, I noticed something odd. A faint light, like that of a flashlight, was moving amidst the trees. It seemed aimless, zigzagging between the trunks, occasionally pausing and then resuming its erratic path. I watched it for a few minutes, trying to make sense of it. Maybe it was a hiker or a local out for a late night stroll. I brushed it off and returned to my book. The next morning, I mentioned the incident to Mrs. Harper, the elderly lady 
lady who ran the local grocery store. She paused, a concerned look crossing her face. It's probably nothing. She said hesitantly, but be careful. These woods have stories, and not all of them are pleasant. Her cryptic warning stayed with me, and that night, I made sure to lock all the doors and windows. As darkness enveloped the cabin, I once again noticed the light. This time, it seemed closer, its movements more deliberate. I turned off the lights in the cabin and watched. After what felt like hours, the light finally retreated, disappearing into the depths of the forest. This became a nightly occurrence. The light would appear, sometimes close, sometimes far, but always there, always watching. I tried to dismiss it as a trick of the mind, a result of the isolation and the countless horror stories I consumed over the years. But deep down, I knew something wasn't right. One evening, as I was returning from the town, I found a bouquet of wildflowers on my doorstep. There was no note, no indication of who had left the, the flowers, though beautiful, sent a chill down my spine. I felt watched, observed from the shadows, determined to get to the bottom of this, I set up a camera facing the woods. If someone was out there, I would catch them the next morning. I eagerly reviewed the footage. The night was quiet until around 3 a.m. when the familiar light appeared. But this time, there was something more. A silhouette of a man, standing at the edge of the woods, just watching the cabin. He stood there for hours, unmoving, until the first light of dawn when he retreated into the forest. The footage was undeniable proof that I wasn't alone. I handed it over to the local sheriff, a burly man named Officer Daniels. He promised to look into it and advised me to stay vigilant. That night, as I lay in bed, every sound was amplified, the rustling of the leaves, the creaking of the cabin, the distant hoot of an owl, and then another sound, footsteps. Slow, deliberate footsteps on the wooden porch. I held my breath, paralyzed by fear. The doorknob rattled, followed by a soft, persistent scratching, like someone dragging their nails on the door. The ordeal felt endless, but eventually, the sound ceased. Warning came, and with it, the discovery of a note pinned to my door. I just want to be close to you. It read in a scrawled, uneven handwriting. Officer Daniels increased patrols around my cabin and advised me to consider relocating, at least until they could identify the mysterious observer. But I was determined not to be driven out of my home by fear. A few nights later, the inevitable confrontation happened. I was awakened by the sound of shattered glass. Crabbing a baseball bat, I cautiously made my way to the living room. The sight that greeted me was the stuff of nightmares. A man, tall and gaunt, with wild eyes and a disheveled appearance, stood amidst the broken shards of the window. Our eyes met, and for a moment, time stood still. Here, even more beautiful up close, he whispered, adrenaline kicked in, and I swung the bat, connecting with his arm. He howled in pain and lunged at me, but I managed to dodge and make a run for the door. The cold night air hit me as I sprinted towards the town, the man's enraged shouts echoing behind me. By the time I I reached the sheriff's office, I was a mess of tears and exhaustion. The man, it turned out, was a drifter with a history of stalking and obsession. He had fixated on me from the moment I'd moved to Hollow Creek. The return to city life was both a relief and a challenge. The towering skyscrapers, the cacophony of traffic, and the sea of familiar faces provided a comforting cloak of anonymity. Yet, every shadow, every unexpected sound, and every glance from a stranger brought back memories of that fateful night in Hollow Creek. My friends and family were supportive, but they couldn't truly understand the depth of my trauma. Nightmares plagued my sleep, and I often found myself double-checking locks and peering out of windows, always on edge. One evening, as I was attending a support group for trauma survivors, I met Alex. He had been through a harrowing experience of his own, having been held hostage during a bank robbery. We connected instantly, finding solace in our shared experiences and the understanding that only someone who's been through a similar ordeal can offer. Together, we embarked on a journey of healing. We attended there be took self-defense classes, and even traveled, pushing ourselves out of our comfort zones. With each challenge we overcame, the shadows of our past began to recede, replaced by newfound strength and resilience. Alex introduced me to the world of blogging. He had started a blog to document his recovery and found it therapeutic to share his story. Encouraged by him, I started my own blog, Whispers from the Woods, where I detailed my experiences in Hollow Creek and the path to recovery. The blog resonated with many, and I began receiving messages from people all over the world, sharing their own stories of survival and seeking advice. What started as a personal outlet grew into a platform for change. Alex and I collaborated, hosting workshops, webinars, and even a podcast focusing on personal safety, mental health, and empowerment. Our efforts caught the attention of various organizations, and we were invited to speak at schools, colleges, and corporate events. We emphasized the importance of being aware of one's surroundings, trusting one's instincts, and seeking help when needed. As the years went by, Hollow Creek became a distant memory, a chapter 
chapter in my life that had shaped but no longer defined me. Alex and I, bound by our shared experiences, decided to take our relationship to the next level. We got married in a beautiful ceremony surrounded by loved ones, a testament to the fact that love and support can heal even the deepest wounds. Today, as I reflect on my journey, I'm filled with gratitude. Gratitude for the second chance at life, for the love and support of those around me, and for the opportunity to make a difference. The silent observer from the woods, though a dark chapter, led me to discover my true calling and purpose. Life is unpredictable, filled with challenges and unexpected twists, but it's also filled with moments of joy, love, and resilience. And as I've learned, even in the darkest moments, there's always a glimmer of hope, a chance for a new beginning. Wrench Street was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone. A quiet suburban lane lined with cherry blossoms and well-kept homes. It was the last place you'd expect anything out of the ordinary to happen. But as I soon discovered, even the most idyllic places can harbor dark secrets. I had moved into number 23, a cozy two-story house, after landing a job at the local high school. The neighbors were welcoming, often dropping by with baked goods or inviting me over for barbecues. It was the perfect fresh start. Then walked into my new life, I began to notice something odd. Every morning, as I left for work, I'd find a single red rose on my doorstep. No note, no indication of who it was from. At first, I brushed it off as a kind gesture from a neighbor, but as days turned into weeks, the roses kept appearing. Curiosity peaked, I decided to set up a camera to catch the mysterious benefactor in the act. The next morning, I eagerly reviewed the footage. At precisely 3.17 a.m., a figure, hooded and barely visible in the dim light, approached my doorstep, placed the rose, and stood there for a few minutes, just staring at my front door before retreating into the shadows. The video sent chills down my spine. This wasn't a friendly gesture, it was something far more sinister. I approached the local police, showing them the footage. Officer Mitchell, a stern-looking man with years of service under his belt, promised to increase patrols in the area and advised me to be cautious. The roses stopped appearing, and for a while, life returned to normal, but the sense of being watched never truly left. I'd often catch glimpses of someone standing across the street, always obscured by shadows or hidden behind trees. Whenever I tried to approach, they'd vanish, leaving me questioning my sanity. One evening, as I was grading papers, I received a call. The voice on the other end was distorted, almost robotic. You're so beautiful when you're focused, it whispered before hanging up. I looked out the window, and there, standing under the street light, was the hooded figure, phone in hand, watching me. Panicked, I called Officer Mitchell, who arrived within minutes. A thorough search of the area yielded no results. The watcher had vanished once again. Mitchell suggested I stay with a friend or family member for a few days, but I refused. This was my home, and I wouldn't be driven out by fear. The next day, I came home to find my front door ajar. Inside, my belongings were scattered, pictures taken off walls, and in the center of the living room, a bouquet of red roses with a note, you can't escape me. The violation of my personal space was the last straw. I decided to take matters into my own hands. With the help of a tech-savvy friend, I set up a series of security cameras and alarms around my property. If the watcher dared to approach, I'd be ready. Weeks went by without incident, just as I began to let my guard down. Down, the alarms blared one fateful night. Rushing to my security feed, I saw the hooded figure trying to enter through the back door. I called the police and, armed with a baseball bat, decided to confront my stalker. The backyard was bathed in the glow of the security lights. The figure, caught off guard, turned to face me. For the first time, I got a clear look at my tormentor. It was a woman, probably in her 40 seconds, with wild, unkempt hair and a manic look in her eyes. Why are you doing this? I demanded. She laughed, a chilling, unhinged sound. You took everything from me she hissed. Before I could react, she lunged at me, a sharp knife glinting in her hand. We struggled, the knife coming dangerously close. But before she could land a blow, sirens wailed in the distance, and she fled, disappearing into the night. The police launched a manhunt, and within hours, she was apprehended. The story that unraveled was both shocking and tragic. The woman, named Lydia, was the previous owner of my house. She had lost it due to financial troubles and had grown resentful of anyone who moved in, watching them, tormenting them, trying to reclaim what she believed was rightfully her. With Lydia behind bars, peace would turn to Wren Street. The neighbors rallied around me, their support unwavering. I decided to stay, refusing to let one person's madness taint my love for the community. I was approached for interviews multiple times, but I declined, wanting to maintain my privacy and process everything in my own time. The community, protective and tight-knit, shielded me from prying eyes, often forming human barriers when reporters got too intrusive. Lydia's trial was a summer affair. As 
details of her life emerged, a picture of a deeply troubled woman took shape. She had faced a series of personal tragedies, from the loss of her husband to a debilitating illness, culminating in the foreclosure of her beloved home. While her actions were inexcusable, there was a palpable sense of pity for her in the courtroom. She was sentenced to a mental health facility where she would receive treatment and counseling. The judge, in his closing remarks, emphasized the importance of community support and understanding mental health issues. Life on Ren Street slowly returned to normal. The media circus moved on, and the cherry blossoms bloomed once more. But the events had left an indelible mark on the community. Neighbors became more vigilant, often checking in on each other and organizing regular community watch meetings. I, too, underwent a transformation. The ordeal had shaken me, but it also made me realize the importance of understanding and compassion. I started volunteering at a local mental health organization, offering support to those in crisis and raising awareness about the importance of mental well-being. One day, as I was conducting a workshop, I received a letter. The handwriting was familiar, and my heart raced as I opened it. It was from Lydia. She wrote of her remorse, her struggles, and her journey to recovery. She thanked me for my understanding and hoped that one day we could meet, not as victim and tormentor, but as two individuals seeking closure. I pondered over the letter for days. Finally, with a heavy heart, I decided to visit Lydia. The meeting was emotional, filled with tears, apologies, and, eventually, forgiveness. We spoke of our lives, our dreams, and our shared love for Ren Street. He was a cathartic experience, one that allowed both of us to find closure and move forward. Today, as I walk the streets of Ren Street, I do so with a renewed sense of purpose. The memories of the Watcher, the Roses, and that faithful confrontation will always be a part of me, but they no longer define me. Instead, they serve as a reminder of the complexities of the human mind, the importance of compassion, and the resilience of the human spirit. Ren Street, with its blossoms and close-knit community, remains a beacon of hope, a testament to the fact that even in the face of adversity, love, understanding, and community can heal the deepest wounds. My daily routine was predictable, from the morning jog around the park to the evening tea at my favorite cafe. It was during one of these routines that I first noticed him. He was tall, with salt and pepper hair, always dressed in a crisp suit. At first, our encounters were fleeting. I spot him across the street while waiting for the bus or in the reflection of a shop window as I passed by. But as days turned into weeks, his presence became more pronounced. He'd be seated a few tables away at the cafe, pretending to read a newspaper but stealing glances in my direction. Or he'd be at the park, always on the same bench, watching me as I jogged by. Concerned, I confided in my friend, Jenna, who worked as a detective for the city police. She advised me to document these encounters, suggesting it might be a case of stalking. The next day, armed with my phone, I discreetly began taking photos of the man whenever I spotted him. The evidence was undeniable. He was everywhere I went, always maintaining a distance but always watching. One evening, as I was leaving work, I felt an overwhelming sense of being followed. Quickening my pace, I darted into a nearby alley, hoping to lose him. But he was relentless. I could hear his footsteps echoing behind me, getting closer. In a moment of desperation, I hid behind a dumpster, dialing Jenna's number. She answered on the second ring, her voice calm and reassuring. Stay where you are, she instructed. I bumped my way. Minutes felt like hours as I crouched in the shadows, the man's footsteps growing louder. Just as he was about to discover my hiding spot, a car's headlights illuminated the alley and Jenna's voice rang out. Police, stay where you are. The man froze, his face a mask of surprise. Jenna, along with two other officers, apprehended him, reading him his rights. At the precinct, the truth unraveled. The man, identified as Robert Langley, was a private investigator hired by my estranged father. My father, diagnosed with a terminal illness, had wanted to reconnect but was unsure how to approach me. Instead of reaching out directly, he had hired Robert to gather information, hoping to find the right moment to reconcile. While Robert's intentions were not malicious, his methods were undoubtedly invasive and unsettling. He was charged with stalking and given a restraining order. My father and I eventually reconnected, working through years of misunderstandings and hurt. While the circumstances were far from ideal, they served as a catalyst for healing and rebuilding our relationship. The aftermath of the incident was a whirlwind of emotions. My colleagues at work, having caught wind of the story, were a mix of concern and intrigued. They dropped by my desk, offering words of comfort or asking for details. The local news even reached out for an interview, but I declined, wanting to keep the matter private. Jenna and I grew closer after the ordeal. Our weekly coffee catch-ups turned 
extended to daily phone calls and frequent dinners. She became my pillar of strength, guiding me through the legal processes and ensuring Robert adhered to the restraining order. One evening, as we were having dinner at a local bistro, she handed me a letter. This came in for you at the precinct, she said, her expression unreadable. The envelope was plain, with my name neatly written on the front. Inside was a letter from Robert. He wrote of his regret and how he had let his professional judgment be clouded by the emotional weight of the task. He had seen the pain in my father's eyes and I wanted to help, even if it meant overstepping boundaries. He apologized for the fear and distress he had caused and hoped that one day I could find it in my heart to forgive him. The letter was a mix of emotions. While I appreciated his sincerity, the trauma of being followed and watched was still fresh. I decided to put it behind me, focusing on mending my relationship with my father and moving forward. Months turned into years and life settled into a new normal. My father and I took a trip together, exploring the countryside and rediscovering our bond. The time away was therapeutic, allowing us to address past grievances and build new memories. Jenna, ever the protective friend, occasionally checked up on Robert, ensuring he kept his distance. She informed me that he had left the private investigation business and was now working as a counselor, helping others navigate the complexities of relationships and personal boundaries. As for me, the experience taught me the importance of trust and the value of second chances. I began volunteering at a local community center, offering support to those who had been through similar experiences. Sharing my story and hearing others helped in the healing process. Today, as I walk the streets of the city, I do so with a renewed sense of purpose. The memories of the silent observer, the fear, and the reconciliation serve as reminders of the unpredictable nature of life. But they also highlight the resilience of the human spirit, the ability to overcome challenges, and the importance of understanding and forgiveness. In the end, it's not the events that define us, but how we choose to respond to them. And as I've learned, even in the darkest moments, there's always a glimmer of hope, a chance for a new beginning. When I moved to the quiet town of Maplewood, I was seeking solace from the bustling chaos of city life. The town, with its tree-lined streets and friendly neighbors, seemed like the perfect escape. I settled into a quaint cottage at the end of Birch Lane, surrounded by a thick canopy of trees. The first few weeks were idyllic. Mornings were spent sipping coffee on the porch, listening to the chirping of birds, while evenings were reserved for long walks, exploring the town's hidden gems. However, things began to change one foggy evening. As I was returning from my walk, I noticed a figure standing in in the driveway of the house next to mine. The house had been vacant for months, so the sight of someone there was unexpected. The man was tall, with a gaunt face and piercing blue eyes that seemed to study me intently. I offered a friendly nod and continued on my way, but a sense of unease settled in. Over the next few days, I'd often spot the man, always at odd hours, either staring at my house from his window or standing in his yard. His gaze never wavering. I tried to brush it off, telling myself he was probably just a curious neighbor. But things escalated one evening when I found a note pinned to my front door. It read, I see you. Do summon it. The handwriting was erratic, and the message sent chills down my spine. Concerned, I approached Mrs. Henderson, an elderly lady who lived a few houses down and had been a resident of Maplewood for decades. Over a cup of tea, I described the man and his odd behavior. Her face turned pale as she listened, and she finally whispered, that sounds like Albert. Albert, she explained had grown up in that house but had moved away years ago after a family tragedy. Rumors had it that he struggled with mental health issues and had developed an obsession with the house, believing it held some secret about his past. Armed with this knowledge, I decided to confront Albert. The next morning, I walked over to his house and knocked. There was no answer, but I could hear faint whispers from inside. Taking a deep breath, I tried the door and to my surprise, it creaked open. The interior was dark, with a thick layer of dust covering everything. Old photographs lined the walls, many of them featured a younger Albert with a woman who bore a striking resemblance to me. My heart raced as I realized the depth of his obsession. Suddenly, a voice echoed from the top of the stairs. You shouldn't be here, Albert hissed, his blue eyes now wild and unhinged. I backed away slowly, trying to calm him down, but he advanced, muttering about how I was the key to unlocking his past. In a moment of desperation, I grabbed a vase from a nearby table and hurled it at him, giving me just enough time to escape. I ran to my house, locking all the doors and windows, and called the police. They arrived within minutes and after a brief standoff, Albert was taken into custody. It was later revealed that he had been off his medication and had indeed developed an unhealthy fixation on the house and me, believing I was a reincarnation of his deceased sister. In the weeks following the incident, the town of Maplewood was abuzz with whispers and speculations. The once peaceful community was shaken, and the story of Albert and his eerie obsession became the stuff of local legend. Parents warned their children about the dangers of talking to strangers, and there was a noticeable increase in security measures throughout the neighborhood. I, too, was 
was grappling with the aftermath, sleep became elusive, with nightmares of Albert's piercing blue eyes haunting my dreams. Every creak of the floorboards or rustle of leaves outside sent me into a panic. The sanctuary I had once found in Maplewood now felt like a prison. Jenna, my best friend from college, insisted I come stay with her in the city for a while. A change of scenery will do you good, she said. And she was right. The hustle and bustle of city life, which I had once sought to escape, now provided a welcome distraction. The towering skyscrapers and crowded streets made me feel anonymous, safe. Jenna introduced me to her circle of friends, and I soon found myself immersed in a world of art galleries, theater shows, and late night coffee sessions. Among them was Alex, a therapist who specialized in trauma counseling. Sensing my distress, he offered to help. Our sessions were intense, filled with tears, anger, and moments of clarity. Alex taught me coping mechanisms, ways to confront and process my fears. He also emphasized the importance of community and support, urging me to reconnect with the residents of Maplewood. With time and therapy, I began to heal. The memories of Albert and that fateful day started to fade, replaced by new experiences and connections. I decided to return to Maplewood, not as a victim, but as a survivor. The community welcomed me back with open arms. Mrs. Henderson, ever the doting neighbor, organized a potluck in my honor. Stories were shared, laughter echoed, and for the first time in months, I felt a sense of belonging. I also started a support group for individuals who had experienced trauma. The group met weekly at the local community center, providing a safe space for sharing and healing. Through these sessions, I met others like me, each with their own story of resilience and hope. One day, as I was sorting through my mail, I came across a letter from the state's mental health facility. It was from Albert. He wrote of his remorse, his struggles with mental illness, and his hope for redemption. He thanked me for the compassion I had shown him, even in the face of danger, and wished me well. The letter was a stark reminder of the complexities of the human mind and the thin line between sanity and madness. It also underscored the importance of understanding, empathy, and the power of second chances. Today, as I sit on my porch, sipping coffee and watching the world go by, I'm filled with gratitude. Gratitude for the journey, for the lessons learned, and for the chance to rebuild and start anew. Maplewood, with its tree-lined streets and tight-knit community, remains a beacon of hope, a testament to the fact that even in the face of adversity, love, understanding, and community can heal the deepest wounds. The highway stretched out before me, a seemingly endless ribbon of asphalt cutting through the vast expanse of the desert. It was late, and the only illumination came from the dim glow of my car's headlights and the occasional passing vehicle. The radio played softly in the background, a late night talk show discussing the mysteries of the universe. I had been driving for hours, making my way back home after a business trip. The monotony of the journey had lulled me into a trance-like state, my thoughts drifting to the upcoming weekend and plans with friends. That's when I noticed it, a pair of headlights in my rearview mirror drawing closer. At first, I thought nothing of it, assuming it was just another traveler making their way through the night. But as the minutes ticked by, I realized the car was tailing me, maintaining a consistent distance regardless of my speed. A sense of unease settled in. I tried to shake off the feeling, telling myself I was just being paranoid. But the car continued to follow, its presence becoming more ominous with each passing mile. Deciding to test my theory, I took a sudden exit, leading to a smaller, less traveled road. To my dismay, the car followed, its headlights now glaringly bright in the darkness. Panic surged through me. Who were they? What did they want? I reached for my phone, intending to call the police, but to my horror, I realized I had no signal. The isolation of the desert, which had once seemed so serene, now felt suffocating. Desperate to lose my pursuer, I floored the gas pedal, my car roaring to life as I sped down the windy road. The mysterious car kept pace, never faltering, its headlights casting eerie shadows on the barren landscape. Up ahead, I spotted a gas station, its neon sign flickering in the distance. Relief washed over over me. I could seek help, find shelter, but as I drew closer, I realized the station was abandoned, its windows boarded up, and the pumps long since dry. With a sinking feeling, I knew I had to keep moving. The road ahead split into two, and on a whim, I took the left fork, leading deeper into the desert. The terrain became rougher, with large rocks and dunes making navigation challenging. But still, the car followed, its persistence unwavering. Hours seemed to pass, the chase becoming a nightmarish game of cat and mouse. My fuel gauge was nearing empty, and I knew I couldn't keep this up much longer. In a last ditch effort, I veered off the road, driving into the vast desert. The car's tires struggled to gain traction on the sandy terrain, but I pushed on, hoping to find some semblance of cover. Finally, I spotted a cluster of large boulders and quickly maneuvered my car behind them, killing the engine and lights. I crouched low, trying to control my breathing, praying the car would pass by. Minutes felt like hours as I waited in the darkness, straining to hear any sign of movement. Just when I thought I was in the clear, the sound of an engine roared to life, followed by blinding 
headlights. The car had found me. I braced myself for the worst, but to my surprise, the car sped past, its occupant seemingly unaware of my hiding spot. I waited for what felt like an eternity before cautiously emerging, my heart still racing. With my fuel nearly depleted, I made my way back to the main road, the first light of dawn breaking on the horizon. The mysterious car was nowhere in sight, its presence now just a haughty memory. I finally reached a populated area, pulling into a diner to gather my thoughts and refuel. The waitress, seeing my disheveled state, offered a sympathetic smile and a hot cup of coffee. As I recounted my harrowing ordeal to her, she listened intently, her expression growing more serious. You're lucky, she said. There have been stories of people going missing on that stretch of road. Some say it's a gang looking for easy targets, while others believe it's something more sinister. That night had a profound impact on my daily life. I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, jumping at the slightest of sounds. Night drives, which I once enjoyed, became a source of anxiety. Every pair of headlights in my rearview mirror sent my heart racing, memories of that relentless pursuit flooding back. Ashley, my roommate, noticed the change in my demeanor. You've been distant lately, she remarked one evening as we sat in our living room. I hesitated, then decided to confide in her about the harrowing chase in the desert. She listened intently, her face a mix of concern and disbelief. That's terrifying, she whispered when I finished. But you know, there might be a way to find out who was behind it. Ashley worked as a tech analyst and had a knack for digging up information online. With my permission, she began her investigation, starting with local news articles and police reports related to incidents on that stretch of highway. Days turned into weeks, and Ashley's search yielded some disturbing findings. There had been multiple reports of similar chases over the past year, all involving a mysterious car tailing lone drivers in the dead of night. Some had managed to escape, like I had, while others weren't so lucky. Their cars were found abandoned, the drivers never to be seen again. The powder was clear, and the implications chilling. We were dealing with a serial predator, one who had evaded capture for far too long. Ashley's next step was to track down survivors, hoping their testimonies would provide clues. Through online forums and support groups, she managed to connect with three individuals, each with their own harrowing tale. We organized a meeting, choosing a public place for safety. As we sat around a table, sharing our experiences, a pattern began to emerge. The car, the pursuit, the tactics, all bore striking similarities. But the most chilling revelation came when we compared the dates of our encounters. They were all spaced exactly two months apart, suggesting a calculated modus operandi. Armed with this information, we approached the local police. While initially skeptical, the weight of our collective testimonies and Ashley's findings was hard to ignore. A task force was set up with the goal of apprehending the perpetrator. The next scheduled date was approaching, and a plan was hatched. Using a decoy, the police hoped to lure the predator into a trap. I volunteered, feeling a sense of responsibility and a burning desire for closure. The night of the operation was tense. I drove down the familiar stretch of highway, the police hidden from view but close by. Hours passed, and just when we were about to call it off, a pair of headlights appeared in my rearview mirror. The chase was on. With the police in pursuit, the mysterious car was finally cornered and forced to a stop. The driver, a middle-aged man with cold and motionless eyes, was arrested. A search of his car revealed a cache of weapons and restraints, leaving no doubt about his sinister intentions. The subsequent trial was swift, with the weight of evidence and testimonies against him. He was sentenced to life in prison, ensuring he'd never pose a threat again. The ordeal brought the survivors closer, forging a bond forged in adversity. We started a support group, helping others who had faced trauma, turning our negative experiences into a force for good. Today, as I drive down the highway, the memories of that night still linger, but they're no longer a source of fear. Instead, they serve as a reminder of resilience, of the strength that comes from unity, and the importance of standing up against the darkness. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.